Hello and welcome to the God's Word Bible study and as usual we'll start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God we thank you Lord for all that you do and we ask you Lord that you will send your Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us and to give us the strength to do what you have shown us. In the holy name of Jesus Christ your Son we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so welcome again, and today we're going to be starting a new series, and the title of this series is Milk, What Every Christian Should Know But Few Do. So, before starting out this series, I sent out an email just asking people what they think I should cover, and I got a lot of suggestions. However, some of the suggestions we will not be dealing with in this series, but I'll be sure to cover them afterwards. So, for example, a lot of people asked about prophecies. And for the purpose of milk, milk is fundamental. fundamental, foundational. We won't be covering anything like prophecies in this series. We'll just be covering the essentials. And here's why. We can easily know all the prophecies and still go to hell. So, my purpose is to help us to get to heaven. And so, what I want to do first is... To make sure that we know all the things that we need to know in order to make it into heaven. Later on, when we are clear of that and we have secured our place in heaven, then we can look at things like the prophecies, Matthew 24, Daniel, Revelation, all of those things, but not initially. Initially, we want to make sure that we are all saved. So we need to learn to walk before we can run. Right. And so in this series, we're going to be doing a lot of fundamental things. So, for example, the first lesson, not today, but the first lesson after this, we'll be doing the sovereignty of God, the glory of God, grace and mercy, repentance, confession, restoration, conviction and conversion, consecration, justification, sanctification, righteousness, forgiveness, baptism faith faith and healing judging why the law was given and things like that but for today we just want to start out with a little discussion a brief discussion on what is milk because in first corinthians 3 1 to 3 and can you read that baby first corinthians 1 to 3 Verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are you not carnal and walk as men? Okay, so what is Paul saying here? He's saying that they're not yet able to bear anything further because they have not yet understood or are walking in the fundamentals of their faith. Okay, so Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. carnal. Now, what does that mean? Just become Christians. They have just become Christians, but babes in Christ are... They drink milk. Look at the verse. You say, But I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So babes in Christ are carnal. Babes in Christ are carnal. Right. They're not yet spiritual. Right. All right. And he says, no, I have fed you with milk. milk and not with meat, meat. for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. Now, so that means that some time has passed some and there time still has passed, been no growth. And he's disappointed in their maturity. You see that? I mean, they're still babes. Right. And he said, For ye are yet yes. carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and, strife. envying and strife and division, are you not carnal and walk as men? So catch this. If there's among you envying, strife, division, bickering, jealousies, any kind of dissension, you're carnal. So when you go to the church and you see the elder not speaking to the deacon and the deacon not speaking to the usher, guess what? They're carnal. They're carnal. Or even the members. And the members not speaking to each other, right. they're carnal. Now, I want to point out one thing. 
Now he's saying that, verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Now my question is, is milk good or bad? It's good. It's good. For the young babes, it's good. Okay. So milk is good for babies. Right. Milk is not for grown-ups. Right. Right? No. Milk is not for grown-ups. Milk is for babies. babies. Now, is meat good? Not for babies. Not for babies. Right. It's good for adults. adults. You see that? And we have to right. get this because a lot of times in church, what we try to do is get people past milk Straight to meat. Food, yeah. And what happens if you have a newborn babe and you give them a steak to eat? They can't digest it and they might choke. They, they choke. might choke. They're they going to die. Yeah. <laughs> they can't chew it. They can't. They can't it, it won't nurture them. Exactly. They need milk. So milk is good. But milk is not forever. Milk is for a little time in your life, at the start of your life, to get you going. Right? Right. So, let's turn to 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3. 1 Peter 2, 1 to 3. It reads, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Amen. So you see here, mark you, in the first passage that we read in 1 Corinthians, it says what? In verse 3, Ye are yet carnal, for there is among you envying and strife and division. You're carnal. Now, in Peter is now coming back and he's echoing what Paul said in that verse. Because he says now, laying aside all malice, and, malice and, guile. and guile and hypocrisy and envy and all evil speaking. Any of those negative things that you have in your life indicates whether you are spiritual or carnal. It's funny how good the word of God is because, for example, in one place when Paul listed a list of sins and wayward behavior, he said, let this not be named once among you. He didn't say not let one of you do this. He said the whole crowd, the whole bunch of you, it shouldn't be mentioned once among you. It shouldn't exist in any of you. It shouldn't exist in this whole entire congregation because God is calling us to a higher standard. So milk is for baby and milk is good. Milk, it says here in First Peter 2, verse 2, it says, that the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby right that you may grow thereby so initially when someone first comes into the church and in the case of many of the people who are in the church and has been in the church for 20 30 40 50 years what they need is some good milk milk they're good some good milk because they're not no the no 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 there's they been no growth they, they haven't grown since that, the day that they got in oh, okay yes that's true so they need some good milk so that they can grow up and so that they can start maturing. Let's go to Hebrews 5, 10 to 14. Hebrews 5, 10 to 14. Verse 10 reads, Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay, good. So, Paul is once again, he's speaking again and he's telling the church that, listen, we have already taught you in verse 12, for when time you ought to be teachers, you have what? You have need that someone teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracle of God. What are the first principles of the oracles of God? Baptism, repentance. Milk. Milk. 
Okay? The first principles is always mill because the first principles are always basic. It's when you go to college. The first courses that you do is what? Science 101. English 101. Math 101. Right? You're doing the basic stuff so that they know that they have laid a good foundation for them to now come, out, come along later on and give you the advanced stuff. Right? So, so it says that they have need for them to, to do this again. So they have been taught once before, but for some reason they have not exercised it or showed that they know it or... Why do they need to be taught again? Because they're not living it. Okay. So it's important that once we learn something that we adopt it and move. Right. Yeah. Right. If, if you know it, but you don't live it, you don't know it. Okay. It's, it's as simple as that. You, I, can, I, I can tell you who you are by what you do. Jesus. If, I, if I watch you long enough, I can tell you if you're a Christian. As Jesus said that you'll know them by their work, by, by, by their, their fruit, love. Mm -hmm. by their fruit, right? By their work, by how they live among each other. But catch us in verse thirteen. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. A babe. A babe. That is true. Right? Now, how many people in the church do you know that whenever you talk about evangelizing and going out and doing ministry and doing, a, they always say what they can't do it because you know, they don't know how to give a Bible story, they don't know how to do this, they don't know how to do that. Why? Because they have not been taught. Because if someone had took them through and done real good Bible study with them, not only would the person have been teaching them the Bible, the person would have been teaching them how to teach the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, when I teach the Bible, I would show people how I get my answer. I am not so interested in telling you what the answer is. Because if I tell you what the answer is, what you're going to do? You're going to go out there and open your mouth and say, Maurice said. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, Maurice has never told you anything about the Bible. Maurice told you what the Bible said. Mm -hmm. Right? So in teaching this way, that, that person now, not only are they getting the knowledge, they're also developing the skill and the techniques in teaching the Bible. Right? So they are unskillful in the world, for they are babes. babes. But it says here, but strong meat belonging to them that are of full age. This is not old people. No. You know, like Maturity the Bible says some places that, you know, for example, Moses died and he was full of age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is just mature. So you can have someone in the church that has been in the church for 20, 30, 40 years. And that person is still a babe. Still a babe and you have a 12 year old who is Very mature. mature. Because it has nothing to do with age. It has to do with adopting the things of God that you have been taught. Right. If you don't implement these things in your life, you can't grow. <laughs> Which is why my thing about it is, that, as I mentioned earlier, I will go into prophecy and all that later on, much later on when I'm finished with this. But teaching you prophecy up front doesn't help you. Because when I'm teaching you prophecy, I'm not telling you how to live with your neighbor next door. Or how to get along with your co-worker. Or how to stop being a jerk. Right. But he says that strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use. Reason of what? Use. That's reason what they, of use. So they've been exercising what they've yeah, been learning. Exactly. Yes. Have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So my question to you now is, who are these people that learn to use the word wisely, that are mature, that are now eating meat. Who are they? Because surprisingly, the Bible tells us who these people are. If you back up to verse 12, they are teachers now who are the ones who are teaching. They're, they're teachers now, but who are they? Christians. Okay, let's jump over to Isaiah 28, 9 and 10, and we'll see who these people are. Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. It reads, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precepts must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now let me ask you a question. 
How many times have you heard that verse repeated in the Bible, verse 10, where it says, for precept, must upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. How many times have you heard that in your Christian walk? Oh, lots of times. How many times have you heard verse 9? And um, no, it's not usually it's not usually used in conjunction with this. You see? So we are not we have, we have not been taught properly. It says that whom shall he teach knowledge? Who's the he here? That's the spirit, the Holy Spirit, people. That's God. The God. That's God. You, you can say the Holy Spirit, but it's directly God. Who shall God teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrines? Those who are weaned from the milk. Those that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. No longer babies. God does not teach babies. I think quite often in the church, the presumption is made regardless of the stage that Christians are in. And, and they are just thrown out and given anything to eat, to spiritually eat without the basics so that they can develop and build on on a solid foundation. So, you know, you people are given whatever the, the pastor has scheduled for that time. <laughs> yes. Well, well I, I put it to you that that's not the problem because any good sermon should be able to feed the babies and the teenagers and the adults and the old people. I mean, spiritually speaking. Any good sermon, right? Because if you're giving meat, then you know that your audience is mature. But before you give them meat, you remind them of the milk, right? So, for example, let me give you an example. I'm going to tell you that how you're supposed to live godly in this present generation, in this present evil world, is that you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if I'm teaching that, and I know that the people who I'm teaching are mature, I'm still going to remind them that before they can love their neighbor as themselves, they have to first love God more than themselves. All right. So you have to remind them, take them back down to, to basic. So who is God going to teach? He's yeah, going to teach the, the yeah, those who have been weaned. Weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. All right. So... A lot of us, when we go into church, we say that we're not going to church because they're not feeding me. Mm. Hold on. People feel that they're not feeding them because they can't take away anything practical from it. What are they going to do with the information that they... No, but, but listen, to, listen to what they says. I don't like to go to church because they're not feeding me. Who needs someone to feed them? Babies. Babies! Right? So they go to church and they're looking for the pastor and they're latching onto his nipple... <laughs> Milk. Because one of the things that when we are mature and we learn to do is that we learn to feed ourselves. ourselves. Right. And then when we come together as a congregation, we are coming together not only to get, but to give. Mm -hmm. And the more mature we get is the less we get and the more we give. give. So where do we get this milk? From our From mothers. mothers. From our mothers, no, no, not not this type, not this. It's funny with this type of milk, we don't get it from our mothers. We get it from our our elders. We get it from our father. Well, for spiritual <laughs> milk, <laughs> All right? For spiritual milk, we don't get it from mommy. We get it from daddy, daddy, because we have no mommy. Yes, we have no okay? spiritual. There's no mother. spiritual mother. There's only a spiritual father. Father. Okay, so let's read Deuteronomy 11, 16 to 23. Deuteronomy 11, 16 to 23. And we are going to see where we get this spiritual milk. Okay, it reads, Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and that ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And when the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, and lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets before your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children 
speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house, and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children, in the land which the Lord swear unto your father to give them, as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you, to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess great nations, and mightier than yourselves. Okay, great. So where do we get this milk? From our fathers teaching us, writing it upon our hearts and souls. Right. We get it from the word of God. And what God is saying here in, in this passage is that we are going to be living the word. You see that? You see where they say we're going to be living the word? Yeah, I teach them when you sit down, walk around, lie down, rise up. So teach them in everything that you do, you're going to be rehearsing the word. Right? And it says that you shall write them upon the doorpost of thine house and upon thy gates. So when you're leaving, you see them. You see them. You reach outside you now, going out to the street on the door on your gate. gate. You see the word again. You're coming home. You see it. What we must understand here is that when you leave and you go to your gate and you're going about your business, you don't stop because he tells you that when thou walkest okay. by the way, sit right? down, rise up. So. All day long, God is always with you, right? Now, catch this. Here's the part that is going to take us from childhood or from babies to adults. Verse 19, sorry. And you shall teach them to your children. To your children. Mm -hmm. You shall teach. Now, hold on. How are you going to teach something? What you must do first before you teach something? Just learn, you it. To learn it. You have to learn it, right? So, for example, Paul said that he forbid a woman to speak in the church. And what he was saying is that if she has a question, she must wait until she gets home, home and ask her, husband. ask her husband. Why is Paul saying that? So as not to interrupt the service that's happening right there. Right. That's, that, that's one. But there's a, even a more important reason why he tells her that. He has more time to explain to her as to what's going on, what, what, she, what she wants to know that's right, but there's an even more important reason for the husband. I think being the, as, as the head of the home, the husband still has a, a certain amount of knowledge of the word of God. So he can pass it on to his wife and his children. That's right. Being the head of the home, the husband is supposed to be the one who is the spiritual leader of the family. And so what happened is that I'm a big knucklehead. I don't know anything spiritual. But I take my wife and my children to church. church. Pastor says something and my wife has a question. She comes home and she asks me. You have to go learn it. So that I have to go to learn, learn it, right? right? How am I going to learn it? You go read the, the word, word of God. Study the word. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Nope, 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 nope. It's easier than that. You ask the pastor. I'm going to go ask the pastor, <laughs> right? I'm going to go ask the pastor and once a pastor explain it to me and I understand it, then I come back home and I explain it to my wife and my wife explain it to the children and you, you get it? So the whole family is growing. Or you explain it to the whole family. But hold on. How many times am I going to want to be running out of my house to go find the pastor so that pastor can tell me what I must tell my wife? <laughs> one time. I want to just do it one time. You get me? So what happened is that if my wife keeps asking me this question, I have to keep running to this other guy. After a while, I'm going to feel my own Inadequate. inadequacy. Right. And at this point, I'm going to say, no, I'm, I'm not going to stand for this. So I'm going to now study right. to show myself approved. Approve. A workman. A workman that needed not be a shame, rightly dividing the word between my wife and my kids. Right? <laughs> And so that is, no, the, the, the Bible isn't just giving us rules for the sake of rules. It's giving us rules for a purpose. Yes. And so once now I start reading and I start studying and I start understanding, I can now feed my family 
myself because you're not your your wife is not supposed to be running to the pastor every time she have a question. Mm-hmm. That is dangerous for the pastor. It's dangerous for your wife, and it's dangerous for you because sooner or later, if that's gonna happen, two people are gonna end up dead, and one person is gonna be in the in the prison. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious because what happened is that you have this thing that. We, we, we as human beings, we have a tendency to fall in love with our teachers. Have you sure. ever, never noticed that? Yeah, that oh, yes. Children, uh, when yes. they start going to school, they worship their teachers. So why do yes. you want your wife to go sit at the, the, the feet of the pastor every time she has a question? She's going to respect the pastor more than you. Exactly. Especially that she's hungry for the word of God. Right. And it's funny. She might be hungry for the word of God and ter- turn out that what? She started feeding on the deeds of the devil. Because you were not diligent in doing the things that you're supposed to do. So, my friends, if you are a man out there and your wife is doing Bible studies with an elder or pastor, it is your duty to be in the same room because you are her spiritual head. And if they tell her errors, it's your fault. You're, you're supposed to be there, and even if you don't know anything, if you're a knucklehead like me, you still go and you sit and you listen. And just by being in your position, God will teach you because you're where you're supposed to be. You're where you're supposed to be. Okay, so the milk is where? In the Word of God. In the Word of God. But I want to point out something in this passage. Because, and by the way, this goes back to someone who had asked about the mark of the beast. So let me give you a hint right here about the mark of the beast. Or the mark of God, whichever way you want to look at it. It says here, verse 18. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. Your eyes. Bind them for a sign upon your hands, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. Now, do you know what the Jews took this verse and did with it? No, they put stuff on their clothing. Um, they wear this thing on, on their... Um, but on their hearts, <laughs> on their chests, and and in their hats. Okay, so they do two things. They have this little box that they strap to their forehead. If you go to the whaling wall, you see them with it, a little black box, and they strap it to their forehead. And then they have another, um, some other cords that they wrap around their forearm down to their hand and wrap it back up. These things are misapplication of the word of God. That is not what God meant. They took it literally. They took it. Lit- no, no. I-, I wouldn't even say literally. Because God meant it literally. Physically. They, they took it physically. Yes. Right? What God meant when he said this is that you must bind them as a sign upon your hand. What does your hand do? Do things. Your hand do things. Your hand Work. work. So if your hand is working, your hand is the thing that is producing fruit. Mm-hmm. And by your f- their fruit, you shall know them. know them. So God is saying, you are supposed, you, these things that I'm teaching you, these, my words, should control what your hand do. Right. Everything that you do should reflect the glory of God. Right. And he says, secondly, you shall, they shall be frontlets between your eyes. What's between your eyes? Your mind, your brain. Your brain. So, for example, if an animal is sick or if I'm hunting, what I want to do is shoot him right between the eyes. Right where his frontlet is. Right? Right. Uh Kind of gross, but that will get you the picture. I'm putting that bullet right between his eye, right in his forehead, right there. Turn out his lights. Right? And he's saying that his word should be where? Right between your eyes. In your brain so it controls how you think think and if it controls how you think then it controls how you you do stuff you act mm-hmm. right 
But what they did is that, and we can see what they did in uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 5, and I'll read that for your benefit. But their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacterates and enlarge the borders of their garments. This is what Christ was talking about. They now make their, the things that they put on their hand and the things that they put on their forehead, they now make them broad and make them fancy and make them attractive so that everybody can look at them and people will think that because your holy. things are so bold and so big and so nice that you're holy. But what were these people? They were misled. They were children still. Now, let me ask you one last question, and we'll end with this question. What is milk? We have been talking about milk, but now I want to ask you another question. What is this milk? Well, we've, well, we've read that milk is gotten from the Word of God, so it must be in the Word of God, so it's knowledge gained from Okay, so what is meat? Meat is also gotten from the word of God. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say to you, um, as it says, milk is the um, instruction on how you to live. So, and meat now is the maturity of how you live in, in today's society. For example, when you're, when you're um, drinking milk, you, the Bible says you can't go out there and teach because you don't know what you're teaching. So you have to be drinking the milk taking in the word of God. But when you're ready, when you wean from the breast, it means that you can go out and witness. So even if they come with their anything that is not, is contrary to the word of God, you can set them straight. You know, it's funny. When you were talking just now about not being able to teach when you're drinking milk, that is so true. Because what does a baby do right after they drink milk? They burp. They burp. But not just burp. They usually... What kind of pregnant you are? <laughs> <laughs> no, they usually puke. puke. Right? Spit, spit out. They, they spit up. Yeah. Because that's why when you when, when you're burping them, you put you you right. put uh, a, a towel on your shoulder, right? Because you know that they're gonna spit up. So what what happened is that we as Christians, we do what? We're feeding on milk and then we run out to do what? To share the, the word with people. Now what they tell you when a baby just finished eating? <laughs> don't shake them up, don't right? Them up. Don't shake them up because if you shake them up, what happens? They think it'll come up. Yeah, they're like a soda bottle, right? Yes. So we know we get some milk and we run out there, shaking up, and when we go out there, you know what we do? Spew all over the. People. We just vomit over somebody. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. That's okay. I'm not discouraging you from doing it. I'm just explaining to you why you do it. But guess what? It's better for you to puke on someone trying to do God's will than not do God's will and not puking on anyone else. Well, you know, like, um, uh, like how God said that when a man gets married, he, can't, he shouldn't go to war or he shouldn't leave his wife or, you know, for a certain period of time. Whatever, One year. For a whole, right. It's similarly when we get married to Christ as newborn, new, new, new married people, we need to take that time to learn of our spouse. Right. So that we, we're not, not distracted by anything else, whether it be work or war or whatever it is that, that <laughs> involves. That's right. That's right. Um, what my wife is saying, and I'll put it in my own words because we have discussed this over the years, is that there is a passage in the Bible that talks about when a man gets married. And the Bible says that if he gets married, he's not supposed to go to war. He's supposed to stay home with his wife for a year. And I, the reason why I love my God so much and my Bible so much, it's, it's so practical. This is what it says. Because God says, I don't want you to get married to a woman and another man lay with her. Because you're dead. So you don't go to war. You stay home and you comfort your wife. One year. Okay? It also says, if you build a house, you shouldn't go to war. You should live in the house first. So that you don't build a house and somebody else come and live in it. Mm -hmm. It also says if you just planted a new field, you don't go to war. Because God doesn't want you to Plant, plant so stuff and someone else eat it. So listen to what God is saying. He doesn't want you to marry a wife 
and someone else sleep with her. He doesn't want you to build a house and somebody else live in it. He doesn't want you to plant and somebody else eat it. What is God saying? God is saying he wants you to enjoy the fruit of your labor. How is this applicable today? And I've seen this so often is that someone newly comes to church, newly comes to Christ, gets baptized, and two weeks later, they're giving him a position in the church. They're giving him a position in the church. They're making him a deacon or an usher or something. It is wrong. Your God says not to do it. He's supposed to sit down for at least a year and learn. During that time, certain things are going to happen. One, you'll find out whether or not he's staying. Whether or not he's truly come to Christ. Right. Second, you will get a chance to see what his spiritual gift is. And then you can appoint him a position or a function in the church that is commensurate with his, with his spiritual gift. So you are not putting him somewhere that God hasn't placed him. Right? And that way he's right in the position that God needs him to be doing the things that God gifted him to be. We get that? Let me tell you a story. There was a church and uh, they had a, a outreach and they got several people baptized and the first regular church service after the people were baptized, they called them up to introduce them to the church. And while they're introducing them, they're telling them what their office is. And I'm sitting there and I I'm appalled because I know that this is wrong. And they reach a young man and they introduce him and they says, and this is going to be our newest deacon. And he goes, yes. And he punched the ear. And I held on my head and I said, my goodness, he's gone. Because already that attitude, you might think it's good. But no, yes. It means that already he Pride is more is in Trusted in position and pride than he's in the word of God. We have, we have put him on a pedestal when we should have put him on the floor so that he can prostrate himself before God and grow up to be a strong man. Within two months, he was gone, never to be seen again. And it happens all the time because we do not do what God says. Now, my wife is going to read Deuteronomy 24, verse 5 for you. So that you can know what we were talking about, about God telling about the man not marrying and going off to war. It says, when a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business. But he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which he had taken. So I love it. It's a, it's a it, hold on. Let's, let, let's take another look at that. It says. When a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war. Neither shall he be charged with any business. You're talking about a honeymoon? <laughs> <laughs> a year long. No, 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 no. This is a one year honeymoon. God is saying, I don't want you doing anything but making your wife happy. Now, that's a solid foundation for marriage, isn't it? Okay, so what is milk? Let us look at Hebrews 6, 1 to 3. Hebrews 6, 1 to 3. Therefore, leaving the principle of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works or, and of on, faith toward God. Not laying again the foundation. Right? Not laying again the foundation. What's another word for foundation? Milk. Milk. Go on. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrines of baptism and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permits. Okay. So Paul is saying that these things are milk. Repentance from dead work, faith towards God, baptism, all of that. He's saying that that's milk. You know what we call these things in the church today? We call it meat. Because I bet you that most Christians can't explain these things to you. So, for example, repentance from dead works. What's that? Isn't he turning away from your sin? Yeah, oh. stop sinning. 
So if you know what repentance from dead work is, don't tell me. Show me. And that's why you have so many people coming in at testimony times and talking about the difficult time that they've had this week with sin and and um, how they were overcome and um, not that they overcome, <laughs> but how they were overcome. <laughs> so, uh, but when we understand, you know, the power that God has given us, the power to overcome sin, and that has always been our power, as it states in Genesis chapter four, I think, when he said to Cain that that sin shall desire him, but you will have dominion over it. So we've always had dominion, but we've always chosen to yield that dominion to our desires and our Right. Now, as I said, this was going to be the last question, and it is. And I, I have some good news and some bad news for you. So did we plainly state what milk was? I'm, I'm, I'm about to. These things he mentioned here is, is milk. But guess what, folks? We're not going to be dealing with these yet. Because there is some more milk that we have to deal with in order for us to deal with this milk that Paul mentioned here. We are so weak in today's church that we need, what is it that you love but to buy, Joy, and I used to tell you not to buy it? 2% milk. Two per, milk light. Light. <laughs> right? That, that's what we're going to have to go back. So we, we're, we're not going to go here because this, this milk, this milk, let me, let me, let me, Tell you how I'm looking at it. This is milk like when the, the, the child is just about to be weaned and you start putting in a little cereal in the formula or something. That's what this milk in Hebrews 6 is. We're not, we're not going here yet. We will get to this, but first we're going to deal with some more foundational things, some lighter thing. Milk 2%. Skim milk. Breast milk. <laughs> All right? As my wife say, breast milk. So what we're going to deal with is... We're going to deal with some real milk. And the first milk we're going to deal with in our next lesson is the sovereignty of God. Now, hold on, Maurice. The sovereignty of God, that's deep. No, that's light. Because if you do not understand the sovereignty of God, you can't do anything that God told you to do. You can't live the Christian life. You first have to understand who your God is before you can understand grace and mercy and repentance and forgiveness and justification on all those other things the foundation that we will build on is god himself so this is the if you're thinking in terms of dating and marrying this is the the introduction yeah yeah this is swiping right <laughs> you swipe right right i don't know I don't know. <laughs> yes, Mr. <laughs> uh, yes, <Mr>. Experience. <laughs> so, okay, so let me, let me just say this. Um, first, we're going to deal with the sovereignty of God. Because once we get God right, then everything will fall into place. We get God wrong, nothing fits. Nothing fi fits. And that is what we experience over and over in our Christian life, is that we're saying that, yeah, I want to do this, but I can't do it. I want to do it because we don't know who our God is. Let me prove that we don't know who our God is because we don't know who we are. You see, first we have to figure out God, then we figure out ourselves. Now, why am I saying that God is light, that God is milk? Because he's revealed himself in the word. He has revealed himself in the word, but more than that, God is the simplest thing that you can think about. The problem that we have with God is that we complicate him. But God is very simple. And when we meet, meet again, we'll go over it and we'll deal with the sovereignty of God. And after that, we will deal with the glory of God. And once we get those two footings properly set, then we'll go on to the other things that will make us better, healthier, more productive Christians. You're going to lay the cornerstone. You've got to lay the cornerstones. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto, unto you. Until we meet again, God bless. Goodbye. <laughs>